I was enlisted when I was 17 back in 2011 for multiple reasons, but I just wanted to serve and fight mostly. Typical 17-year-old jock video gamer, right? Anyways, even though I was an 0331 machine gunner in the infantry, I never saw combat because the war had died down quite a bit and I got sent all over Asia and the Pacific instead. But stuff got weird in Korea. We were sent to this island just miles off the DMZ of North Korea to train with the Republic of South Korean Marines, ROK Marines. It's a small island, maybe 10 miles across, but it had an insane amount of hills. While on the island, we were camping on this small ridge that nearly surrounded the campsite. Perfect location to set up at. You're concealed, there's only one way in and one way out. Ideal for any military camp. It rained a lot there, though, so we stored our weapons and ammunition in a small rundown bunker just up the ridge from our site. We took shifts guarding it overnight, and let me tell you, stuff got weird. I'm sleeping in my tent when I wake up to use the restroom. On my way back, I see the strobe light from my friend standing watching up on the hill. This is not normal. He was trying to signal someone without waking anyone up from yelling. So I head over to check on him, and he's shaking, eyes wide, complete fear panic mode. The conversation went something like this. Hey man, you okay? Dude. Something is up here. What do you mean? Like, North Koreans? No, worse. I'm hearing voices. I saw shadows. I can hear rustling in the bunker. But every time I check it out, there's nothing there. Jesus, you sure you're not just sleep deprived? No, man. I'm completely fine. But I'm freaking out. Could you chill with me till I calm down? Sh sure, dude. It was around 0300 when I stayed with him. Everyone was going to be awake in two hours as it is, so it wouldn't be too long. Nothing happened while I was with him. So around 0400, he was back to normal and the sun was on the horizon. I told him if he needed anything to yell and went back to bed for an hour. The following night, it was my shift overnight. From 2200 to 130, it was quiet. It was kind of peaceful, but... At 1.45 to 2, I heard footsteps. The bunker was to my back and I was facing the camp, seeing as how the only way to reach this bunker is from the camp unless you can climb a 90 degree cliff from the other side of the ridge without anyone noticing. Everyone is asleep and the footsteps were behind me near the bunker. I turned around and saw nothing. Shortly after, I can hear faint whispers, definitely not English. I could almost make out Korean phrases, but it was too faint to know for sure. This is where I start to get nervous. I remember seeing my friend's face when I came up to see him. His fear was genuine, very real, and I was starting to see why. Then a little later, I hear something in the bunker. I turn my light on and shine it in the bunker. No one's in there. And at 0300, I hear it again. This time thinking it was nothing, I turn to look without my light and see the shadow of someone standing over the SMAWs, the rocket launchers, bending down to pick one up. I raised my rifle and shouted at him to get out of here, and it turned its head, looked at me, and vanished. Just evaporated, like Spider-Man in Infinity War. Panic struck me. I was freaking out like my friend. In my head, I was thinking, what good is this 5.56 M4 against a ghost? Nothing else happened after that, but I was on edge till sunrise. I kept the story to myself until my unit got back to Japan where we were stationed. One night, we were all drinking, shooting the breeze, and a different friend asked us if the island seemed creepy to us. My first friend mentioned his experience on watch, and everyone... I mean, everyone had some kind of similar story to tell from when they were on watch. Turns out this island was a hotspot for strategic positioning and planning during the war, and thousands of soldiers and civilians died there. I guess the war isn't over for them. Yet.
my partner and I moved into our first apartment together in Pasadena, California. The unit was in this old home that was in a beautiful historic part of Pasadena. Our unit was on the third level of the house, essentially being this huge converted attic. The apartment was beautiful and had lots of space. It did have an odd energy from the very beginning. However, my partner didn't believe in anything supernatural or paranormal, so he would always joke around when I made comments about a space feeling heavy or intense. After a few weeks, things started to happen in our apartment. It all started with doors. They would move back and forth or slam shut. I would make comments to my partner, but he said it was probably just the wind, as we had two balconies with lots of air circulation. I also noticed that our cats were never inside. I have two cats, and they are more like dogs. They are always around me and cuddle up. They usually go outside for one to three hours a day. In this apartment, they would be gone all day, sometimes not even coming back at night. I was trying to chill about everything because nothing dramatic had occurred yet. One day, I had just left the apartment and my partner was inside alone. He called me and was really scared over the phone. He told me that he had seen a man wearing all black walk through the apartment and into our bedroom. He ran to the bedroom and said he saw the man walk onto the balcony and fade away. He was begging me to come home. When I got back, he was trying to rationalize something that wasn't possible to him. I told him some stories of my past and some encounters I had with the paranormal. He calmed me down and we eventually went to sleep. This was the beginning of torture. I started to hear something walk and run up and down the stairs. It would happen throughout the night and started every night around 2 a.m. I started to lose so much sleep because I would constantly open our bedroom door to check and nothing was there. My partner was a deep sleeper, so he didn't hear anything. I did not think I can see apparitions, but I could sense someone standing right next to me as I slept. I know this may sound weird, but it would talk to me in my sleep. It would tell me to end my life and other awful things. I would often wake up and hear whispers like right in my ear. The rate of the speech was so rapid and intense. My boyfriend was starting to act very detached. He also started drinking daily. We used to have wine night at least once a week and go out with friends occasionally, but we didn't drink much. I would see him taking shots and hiding vodka and sodas. I didn't question him because I thought he was just stressed. One morning we wake up and I noticed that he had scratches all over his back and on his legs. I freaked out and told him to look in the mirror. He was really scared and said he didn't know where they came from. The scratches continued for weeks and bite marks started to form as well. My boyfriend also saw the man in black again one night. After that, he was no longer a skeptic. He believed that something was in our home. I, being stupid, started talking to this energy when I was alone. I would ask it to please leave us alone. I would sage our home too. Everything just got much worse after that. At night, our living room TV would randomly turn on and the volume would be at max. We would both jump up out of bed panicked and turn the TV off. One day I was watching TV with my cat next to me and I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I thought it was my partner. The steps continued towards me and I couldn't see anyone and I started to feel fear. Suddenly my cat was thrown across the room. My cat screeched and ran off. I felt cornered. I wear black tourmaline crystals and I remember just holding on to it for protection. Through all this pain I reached out to a local psychic medium that had experience with home cleanses. I met him in person and he told me something was with me. I was like, please don't scare me, I really can't handle more weird stuff. He said, no, there is something with you that isn't human. He told me that he would need to go to our home ASAP. He came a few days later and he said the entity was there again, but he spoke with me in private. He told me that this entity was attaching itself to my partner and that he needed to do this bath cleanse for my partner. I never told him this because he was truly freaked out already. The medium walked around the apartment and said that there were multiple energies in the home. 
He said that me talking to them and using sage can sometimes invite other, worse things into the home. He used some other type of stuff to cleanse the house. We then made this bath for my partner. He was to sit in the bath with all the lights out for 30 minutes and not to get out. I told them that I would do it another day for myself as I didn't want to alarm him. He did the bath and things were cool for a few weeks. Eventually everything started up again. I remember being at a wedding with my friend and my partner calls me on the phone hysterically talking. He said that some of the dishes in our kitchen just started falling to the ground and that he was scared. I left the wedding early to be with him. That night we decided to break our lease and get out of there. In two weeks we had a new apartment and paid a lot of money to get out of our lease. The landlord worked with us. She also provided me with information of the previous tenants. I told her the honest truth and... She didn't believe me though. I talked to the previous tenants on the phone. They were also a young couple. The girl shared that she would often hear footsteps, see the door slam, and always felt on edge. However, it didn't escalate for them. They lived there for 16 months, and it was comforting to receive some validation. Crazy side note, the first day in our new apartment, a pipe busted and was shooting water everywhere. It happened at 3 a.m. and we were so scared that something had followed us. After the pipe, nothing ever happened again, but we were still haunted by the memories. My partner never questioned my intuition now and he even asked me, how do you feel in this space, etc. He's like a real believer now. So many other things happened in the Pasadena place like my boyfriend seeing kids in the bathroom, flickering lights, intense cold spots, and the constant feeling that Someone is standing right next to you. I am happy to finally share this story. I have told a few friends. All but one does not believe me. One even laughed while I was telling her. I stopped telling the story to people because I felt like it was inviting negative energy back. Now, thank you all for reading this and I hope this story resonates with at least someone. Two thousand eleven was a terrible time for our family. My uncle, whom I was super close to, and my dad were both fighting cancer. Uncle found out he had it in November of two thousand ten. By December he was told he only had months to live. He lived with me in West Virginia before I moved in two thousand eight, and then when he got this news, he moved south to be with his sister so she and I could care for him. January, we had a huge going away party for him for New Year's, our family does this when we have time to prepare for death. It allows us to celebrate and also get in our goodbyes. Now some backstory, when my uncle lived with me in West Virginia, my ex got the three of us phones. My uncle still used the phone, even though it was years old and beat to death. We finally got that phone off and got him a new one and set it up so he could hear clearly when he needed to make calls. The whole family stayed from New Year's until he passed, which was March. During the whole stay, naturally, all of his siblings kept falling apart and having emotional breakdowns. My only words of comfort to them were, It's okay. He's okay. It'll get better. Wanting him to stay like this is selfish and abusive, and the only way to make him better is to let him go. It's okay. He'll be okay. At one point in the dark morning, he woke up and said he loved everybody and wanted something to drink, then passed holding my hand about 15 minutes later. When he passed, he did this weird thing where his entire body straightened out stiff and kind of hovered over the recliner before he flopped back down into it and made his last exhale. I was next to him holding his hand and it kind of freaked me out at first. Thought maybe he was having a nightmare or something. We have a huge family and everyone was in there talking. I tried to get someone's attention since all of my aunts are nurses and nobody heard me. Finally, one did and checked him and he was gone. The coroner picked him up a couple of hours later just as the sun came up. I lived about five miles away so I drove home to pack my clothes since I knew I would be going to West Virginia for about a week for the funeral. I was home for about 30 to 45 minutes and my phone rang. I answered it and... It was mere static as if those someone butt-dialed you with the phone in their pocket. I looked to see who it was and it was him. 
I paused for a second, then thought maybe that the family had been checking his phone and accidentally called me, so I didn't think much and just went about my business. The following day, my aunt gave me some of his belongings, like the bandanas he wore when he rode his motorcycle and different things, and among them was his old broken phone that my ex and I had gotten him. I kept them all together in a freezer bag so I wouldn't lose anything ever. There was one more time I got a static call and thought it was my aunt again, but I can't remember where it falls into the timeline. Fast forward a week, I've already gone to West Virginia for the funeral and I'm back home. My phone rings. It's my uncle again. I answer it, going to try to tell my aunt to quit calling me and through the static, I hear, Don, Don, being yelled as if though someone were seriously trying to talk over the static you get when your phone signal is breaking up. It threw me for a loop because only a few people in my family called me the Double Don nickname and it's only aunts and uncles. This particular uncle's voice is unmistakable. I sat confused, trying to figure out who would have his phone who sounded like him. My aunt certainly wouldn't. I said, Hey, can you hear me? He yelled my name again, as if he hadn't heard a thing. Don! Don! Then I heard what sounded like another part of a sentence that was so broken up I couldn't make it out. I'm a believer in the paranormal, but I'm also very locally and scientifically based as well, so if things can have a worldly explanation, I always take that route first. I said, Who is this? Can you hear me? Static for a few seconds, then just a single, Don. Unmistakably, that's my uncle's voice. So now I'm on the paranormal train, but... No worries, because if you've read any of my blogs or heard any of my other stories, you know paranormal is normal for me. It doesn't scare me in the slightest, so I respond, Norman, can you hear me? What's wrong? Static. I yell Norman again, only to hear more static. I sat there listening for about ten more seconds, then it hung up. I looked down at the phone and realized that the call had come from his old phone, the one that didn't have service on it the one on my mantle, in a bag. I was stunned, but impressed. It meant a lot to me that he would go out of his way to make contact like that. I waited a while before I said anything to my family about it. Some can talk openly about paranormal stuff, and some believe it's Satan sending demons to mess with you. But I told a few, and they were just like, hmm, interesting. Didn't express belief nor disbelief. They were just like, that must have been cool. It was strange. But fast forward to Christmas. My dad dies lying next to me in the bed. My cousin comes in to check his vitals just in time to see him die on me. She starts to panic, but I managed to get her to pull her stuff together because we had to wake up my mom, sister, her mom, the grandkids, and everybody else with the news. I couldn't be the only sane person in the house dealing with a bunch of crazies falling apart. I needed a support system. I didn't realize it at the time, despite the fact that my cousin was a nurse too. Watching him die traumatized her. I was too preoccupied to notice that she had gone silent and couldn't speak. The poor girl couldn't utter a single word for a whole month. So we get my dad bathed and changed and ready for his road trip with the funeral director, and while my brother-in-law and I are in there doing that, I hear a commotion coming through the house. It's my aunt and mother who are in the dining room with my cousin. I assume they are just having their emotional outbursts, as normally expected, and I leave them alone. After Dad leaves and we are sitting around talking, my mom says, Didn't Norman call you after he left the house that morning? My aunt and cousin are sitting there staring at me, so I wasn't sure where this conversation was going to go. I said, Yeah, he called me a few times after he left. Actually, he only got to talk to me once, that last time. What'd he say? Nothing. Just yelled my nickname a couple of times. Tried to say something else, but I couldn't make it out. Guess what? My mom said, wiggling her fingers for my cousin to give me her cell phone. He just texted Tiff. She handed me the phone, and a text from Norman said, It's okay. I smiled and said, 
It is okay. I looked up at the number. And you know what? I said, handing Tiff her phone. I have that phone that texted you. It's cut off. Tiff was traumatized for a month and I thought it was beautiful that Norman went out of his way again to comfort her using my own words of comfort. It's okay. No pain. No cancer. No problems. It's okay. A little earlier, my daughter was complaining about a headache. I had her drink a big glass of water and took her down the hall to lay on my bed. As I got her settled, I left to grab a cold rag and an ice pack to lay on her forehead. When I got back and put the rag on her head, she told me that she had saw something weird. I'll write out the conversation. When you walked out the bedroom, I saw something weird. Well, what did you see? I was just laying right here with my hand on my head looking at the wall toward the foot of the bed and then I saw something pop up and go back down. Oh, what did it look like? It was white. It just jumped up looking at me and fell back down. That's interesting. Yeah, it had long pointy ears on the top of its head. I don't know what that was. Well, thank you for telling me that, sister. Uh, how does it make you feel? Are you okay? I'm okay, but it scared me. I didn't know it was there. Then I saw its pointy ears and big eyes, and then it fell back down, and I don't know where it went. I love you, girl. I don't see it anywhere anymore. Make sure to tell me if you see anything again, okay? She nodded her head. I left shortly after and told my husband what my daughter told me. He seemed concerned and then said maybe it was the Easter Bunny. Then the light bulb lit up on that thought. I went back to the bedroom and told her. I talked to daddy about what you told me. He said he thinks it might be the Easter Bunny. I said that in an attempt to make her feel okay about the encounter and I don't ever want to discredit my children coming to me over something I may not understand. I never wanted to be the parent who says, oh, you're imagining it, or oh, you are dreaming, or no, that's not a thing, etc. But I also didn't want her to be afraid, so I was hoping she would equate it to being an Easter Bunny and feel somewhat relieved. When I told her Daddy thought it might be the Easter Bunny, she clutched the blanket up to her nose and said, I hope that's not what the Easter Bunny is. It doesn't look like a bunny at all. It looks like a creature with no fur. I said, okay, maybe not. We just thought that's what it might have been. I will say when she first started complaining about her headache, I had her walk heel to toe in a straight line to see if her balance was off after seeing that threat earlier about a guy whose young son died of brain cancer. My mom anxiety came out full as soon as I read that. I more or less wanted to document what she experienced in this post and wanted to be open to anything someone might have to say about this. I am also thinking her headache may have something to do with her experience. She might have had some sort of hallucination as a result of her headache. I'm not sure either way and am not ruling it out. Thank you to everyone who might be reading this and might have something to say. Now, just to edit and add a few things, she didn't have a fever is one of the first things I checked. She very rarely gets headaches, although my eldest gets them frequently. A couple of responses mentioned about previous and future experiences. There have been other things, and I'll go ahead and mention them down here. My eldest son had experiences when he was younger. He was adamant that he had an older brother. His name was something like Molt or Mort, but my son had a speech impediment, and I couldn't figure out what exactly he was trying to say his name was. It sounded like he was saying either of those two, and when repeated both the names back to him, he kept shaking his head, saying, No, it's Molt. I still don't know what he was trying to say. Apparently, Molt lived far away across the water by shore. He talked about him a lot randomly. I assumed it was an act of imagination, and being the oldest, he wanted something he couldn't have. A big brother, but I'd let him talk about it. I would respond saying I've never met him and so I didn't know who he was. 
My daughter, when she was four, told me her blankets kept moving around at night. I asked her what she meant. She proceeded to jumble up her blankets, raise her bed skirt up, and the curtain way out. She said she couldn't reach high enough to make it as high as it was going. I said something along the lines of the wind coming through the cracks in the window. The window is sealed tightly, no drafts when it's windy. This happened on and off for quite some time. Then she said she could hear things moving in her closet at night and she couldn't sleep. She said it was too loud. I told her that there might be a toy with a battery dying and it's making the toy glitch sound. My youngest son is four. He currently sleeps in our bed. Our bedroom has a bathroom attached to it at the side of the room. The foot of the bed is pointing. Usually the door is open to the bathroom but all the lights are off. That night he whispered to me, Mommy, do you see those shapes? I said, what shapes? Where? He said, in front of the bathroom. He said they were white and kept changing shapes. He said it was scary and put his head under the covers. I said that everything was okay and shut the bathroom door. It was likely his eyes were trying to adjust to the darkness and made him scared, but I thought it was worth mentioning. To be honest, there have been several more things that I could talk about with this and I know it seems like a lot, but it's just things spread out over a considerable time. It's not like we were constantly talking about ghosts and spooky things. And this type of topic doesn't come up in conversation, and I like to think we're a normal family living normally. Not eccentric and bizarre, if that makes sense. I just wanted to add the other couple things in here for those wondering. I think all of it could be explained away, but it's concerning thinking in one sitting all the things that happened to me over time in these years. Thanks again for everyone responding to me. When I was a little boy, three years old, my folks had rented a house off of a lady. I had the bedroom directly off the living room with the TV kitty corner to the left of my door. They told me they kept the TV low so as not to wake me when they watched it and that my door was always left open a few inches. They told me after a few months in the house I started to talk in my sleep which I had never done previously. The first few times they brushed it off but it had become a nightly habit so they began to listen to me sleep talking. My folks said it always occurred between 9 to 10 p.m. each night and they had repeatedly overheard me saying things like, Chocolate man, I'm sleepy. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm tired, chocolate man. Please let me sleep. My parents told me this went on for several months straight, and whenever they came into my room, I would automatically stop talking, so they would wake me and see if I was okay. I recall waking up one morning. If I remember, it was about 5.38 a.m., and the sun was starting to rise. I remember automatically opening my eyes and staring at my closet, which had no door to it. There was a curtain instead which was opened. I still recall the terror I felt at that moment and I couldn't take my eyes off the closet. I had sat up and was sweating profusely. I was telling myself to run to mommy and daddy's bed but couldn't do it. I started counting the three and attempted to run out of there several times. By the time I had the courage to run I was soaked in sweat and almost hysterical and was crying out but I had no voice. I finally jumped in between my folks and was silently crying. My dad woke and asked if I was okay and I recall saying yes. The next day I asked, What are ghosts, dad? He said they're the boogeyman but laughed and said there's no such thing. They also told me that I didn't want to sleep in my room at night anymore but I don't remember that. Finally my parents said the landlady came to visit one day and they had brought the subject up to her about my nightly conversations with the chocolate man. Both my folks said that she started to cry, and she told them that she had to go but would be back later if it was okay. When asked if she could see me and my folks said yes, the landlady had come back later that day and my parents said that she had picked me up and began sobbing and was hugging me and giving me kisses. They didn't know what was going on and asked her. The landlady then gave me a set of rosary beads and asked if they could let her take me to my room with her. Well, they did, and my folks said she put the rosary beads on me and began silent prayers. After that was done, they all went outside, and she explained to them that she used to live in that house with her husband and son. 
The husband passed away from a heart attack, and the room I had slept in used to be her son's. She told them she had went to church that day to pray for me. My parents told me that she said her son was 21 when he passed away. He had hung himself in the closet in my room. At that time I had no concept of color or ghosts and really meant no harm as I later found out that the landlady was an African Canadian. I have several stories of Mexico. It's a place of many myths and legends. This one is a tale a friend of mine recounted to me about his uncle and his friend stuck in a horrifying circumstance. My buddy's uncle and his friend were headed home on a highway one night years ago in the state of Oaxaca. You see, they rode in one of those old flatbed trucks that were used to put whatever vegetables or fruits that might have been picked that day. They were farmers. Most were, as Oaxaca was very rural at the time and had only just had a highway installed of actual concrete. And as they were returning home, the uncle noticed something in the rearview mirror and made out what seemed to be a horse about, I'll say, maybe 150 feet away. He couldn't really make out its features and didn't think anything of it till he drifted off to sleep in the passenger seat. As he slept, the uncle had a small nightmare of a horse with large black eyes running up to his passenger side that startled him awake. He gathered his bearings when he looked over to his buddy that was driving with a terrified look on his face and going about 50 miles an hour, which at the time was pretty fast for a truck that size. He asked, Why are you driving so fast? And the friend responded by saying that they were being followed. He said for the past couple miles, that horse in the rear view was slowly inching its way closer and closer to the vehicle. That's when the panic began to settle in, and they both felt immense fear wash over them. They sped up to about 65 to try to get away, but the clanking of the hooves of this horse slowly kept getting louder and louder behind them. The one driving said not to turn around and look anymore, to just look ahead and not look at the horse because it seemed to gain on them whenever they glanced back at it. The uncle closed his eyes in fear, only listening, and when the hooves inched closer and closer, he glanced to the side of the window and saw the large black eyes of the horse looking directly at his friend from the passenger side as it had caught up now. The uncle screamed for his friend not to look and to just look straight because the horse had a fixated gaze on him. They sped up all they could and still the horse kept a swift pace still staring at the driver. When he finally glanced he began to cry, overwhelmed with emotion and panic when the horse suddenly began to slow down. And as it did, the uncle saw it in the rear view once more, except this time, it had no legs. It was just standing in the road, floating, staring at them with its huge black eyes. They told the grandfather of the man driving when they arrived home what they had witnessed, and he told them that the road that was built there had gone straight through sacred Nahuatl territory and they had been lucky to drive past the area at this time of night because everyone had felt that the ground was salado, or salted, meaning washed with bad energy. While visiting my family in the island of Lombok, Indonesia, I heard what I believed to be a witch, known as a leok fall from the sky onto our roof. I had lived in Australia my whole life, but my dad who was from Indonesia has family over there. Three years ago when I, along with my mom, dad, and sister were staying with my dad's family, something creepy happened. We were sleeping in a back room of my uncle's deli under a corrugated iron ceiling. The room was small and only had one small window which was just a square cutout with four or five metal rods in it kind of like you would imagine a jail cell would have. The window had a small curtain over it. In the middle of the night, my whole family, mum, dad, sister, and I, woke up to an extremely loud bang on our roof, followed by scratching. The sound was too loud to be created by something as large as a cat or a dog. There was no trees for an animal to jump or fall from anyway. My mum, who 
had never experienced anything paranormal living in Australia her whole life, became a little worried. Even she was suspecting something paranormal. My dad wasn't surprised, though. He has told me many stories about the things like this when he lived in Indonesia. The next morning, my dad told his brothers and sisters about what happened, and they weren't surprised either. They told him that recently, almost every night, layaks have been running around on people's roofs. They described them as humans with crow-like wings running, flying, and screaming. Pretty much next to my uncle's deli in our land, there is a village which has their own culture and beliefs. My other uncle married a woman from that village, so our family are quite close with the people. In that village, there is like a shaman and a woman called a dukun. They are an old couple who the villagers always come to when there is a problem with spirits and stuff. The wife is just a small old lady whose teeth are stained reddish black due to chewing on betel nuts all day long. The husband and I don't remember what he looked like. My family visited them once because they wanted to perform some type of ritual with us, maybe to cleanse us or something. Anyway, my dad told me that the Dukun suspected that there were a few layaks in the area. A lady and her mother lived in the house next door to my uncle's deli, and they were the ones who suspected this. They thought it was best that they just keep it to themselves and not accuse the ladies of something like this. The creepy thing is, the neighbor's house was next to our room, right where the small window was. In the few nights that I stayed there, I, who was sleeping next to the window, had a terrible night's sleep. I woke up with a really bad heat rash and just sheer uncomfort. My dad told me that several times in the night he noticed that the curtain on the window was opened, even after he kept closing it. He also had a strange feeling that someone was looking in. A little bit of information about Laox. They are human beings who practice black magic, causing them to turn into supernatural beings. In each region of Indonesia, there are different types of creatures like this, with different names and appearances, but in Bali and Lombok, it is known as Laox. During the day, they appear as normal humans, but at night, they leave the house and do whatever they do. You can learn more about them online. Just search Layak Witch. I have many stories from my dad, but I decided to tell this one since I experienced it myself. I will be posting another short story later about weird sightings after tragic earthquakes hit Lombok last year in 2018, but feel free to ask me questions in the comments and hopefully I can answer some of them. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I lived in a very weird house. It had some serious history with what it had been and how it was built. The house itself was built in 1910 and sometime around 1940 the front of the house was expanded with a large storefront style front end added that was turned into a repair shop of some kind. When the expansion to the house happened, they extended the basement. The basement was one long corridor about 60 feet long, but this is where it got weird. In the early 60s, it went from being a repair shop to an underground brothel and the basement had a whole line of rooms on the left side that were big enough for a twin bed and a night table. There were seven rooms like this, each the same as before in design. At the very end of the basement was one larger room which was about the size of the king-sized beds to give a visual image. Along the main corridor were pillars in the middle of the walkway outside of each room and they all had large loops like you would find for tying up horses or cattle. But the house had no history of being a farm base house. In the early 70s, there was a man who killed seven of the working ladies at the brothel then ended his own life. The city obviously shut it down at this point, and it was sold later to be turned into a concert hall in the front storefront style area. So needless to say, the house was interesting at best, but for a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds, it was the most lit place to rent. It was a constant party house, but it was ours. In the front area, we turned into a lounge with a ton of couches and tables for doing what teens in their first place do best. In the end, the house was paid for by me and three other friends. Before living here, I didn't believe in ghosts or any of that, but after living in that house, even to this day, I don't fully know how to explain the events that occurred. 
but it started out where the unexplained things we just thought were someone else in the house. One day my friends and I were all sitting in the back room of the house when we heard a loud crash. We looked out to see the light in the kitchen strobing and our ferret was screaming who we kept in the cage in the kitchen dining area. We heard another slam and can see his cage and the lights slide past the doorway. We obviously run to find out what was going on, but when we entered the kitchen, there was nothing there, just our little dude freaking out. We couldn't ever figure out what was going on, but when this happened, it got us all talking about our own events. Over the course of the next few months, we started to gain a feeling for each one of the spirits that shared the house with us. I don't know how to put it, but we felt that there were at least two good warm spirits and one very angry and violent one. We started having physical interactions with them, which to this day I can't fully explain other than what felt like a warm hand on my shoulder kind of experience, and then the other which resulted in what looked like burns and scratches. When we lived here, we had a set of three paintings that made up one painting. When we put them on the wall in correct order, they would get ripped off the wall. Sometimes we would come home to them on the other side of the room, and other times it would happen with us watching like we were sitting around drinking or whatever else. Now if we put them up in the wrong order, nothing ever happened to them. In the end, they lived in the wrong order for this reason. We had a number of stereos in the house and they would all go to white noise after listening to them. These were the old style with knobs to change the stations around so we ended up taping them in place but they still would sometimes go to white noise anyways. After living here for two years we gave names to them. We named Rose and Jill for what we can only assume were the two working girls and Henry, the killer we think, we dubbed the mean one that would inflict pain and anger to the rooms. Henry would also slam doors and cupboards, sometimes would throw plates or glasses. When we would take showers, the mirrors would show handprints in the condensation, and we would hear what sounded like faint woman talking when no one else was home. One night, my friend and I were throwing a Nerf football back and forth. The ball bounced and hit a large white vase that was in the house when we moved in. It fell over and crashed on the floor into pieces. We felt like this must have made Henry angry because both of us felt burns and had scratches on our backs the raised welt kind of scratches, and his activity levels skyrocketed for the next week or so. I don't know what really brought me to type this all out, but in the end, it felt therapeutic to tell someone for the first time outside of my friend's circle about these events. My friend and I, who I'll just call Allie, decided to mess around with a Ouija board for fun. Neither of us actually own one, so we made it out of paper. As you can imagine, it didn't look so good, but it wasn't terrible. We also somehow crumpled it up, but I don't remember how. At first, nothing was happening because both of us were laughing and spelling out fake stuff on the board. After laughing a bit more, we actually got serious. It took a few tries, but something actually started talking to us. It was moving a bit slow at first, but got faster and faster. We both thought either one were moving it. We asked if it could give us a name, and it went to yes, but didn't actually spell anything out. We asked if it was human, and it said yes. We asked when they were born, and they went to four. My friend asked BC or AD, and it said BC. We both thought that this was weird and moved on. We asked if it knew who Castile was. I watched Supernatural, so it was kind of a joke, and they said yes. I asked if they knew other angels, and they said yes. We then asked what they were again, and they spelled out Angel. We asked what their name was again, and they spelled out A-N-O-A, Anoa. I asked if it watched me, and it said yes. So I asked if it was a guardian angel, and it said no. By the way... It didn't want to go to the no all the way across the board, so we just said use the blank spaces no. My mom walked in at some point, so we had to hide the board because I don't think she would have liked us playing with it. She probably knew something was up because we were acting super suspicious, but decided to ignore it. She then said she was leaving, so we were going to be alone. We got the board back out again, and 
asked if it was still there, and immediately went to yes. At this point, we both knew it was a demon, so we asked, and it started to spell out Zozo, so we said goodbye. But since we're both dumb and desperate, we went back on. We said it was okay it was a demon and continued talking. We asked if it was actually Zozo or not, and to go to D for a different demon, and it went to D. We asked if Zozo was even real, and they basically said they couldn't say. We asked if demons have genders, and they said yes, and that they were a boy. After this, we started asking questions the others didn't know, like what our grandma's name was. Asked if either of us had connections to dead people, and my friend said yes, and asked the demon which one he wanted to talk about, and they spelled out M, which was the first letter of her mom's best friend's name, who died. Allie then asked how she died. The police didn't know if it was a murder or she ended her own life, and it spelled out man. At the time, I didn't know the story, so she explained it to me. She then asked who it was, and it spelled out the girl's boyfriend. After that, my friend wanted to get off the topic, so we did. I asked if it knew my uncle's name, which I forgot because he's been dead for a while. It was one of those things I'd see and know. It spelled out C, and I remembered his name, which did start with a C. I asked if he knew what my grandpa's name was, and it gave a T, which was the first letter of his name. I asked if he could tell me how he died, and he spelled out cancer. I then asked if it could give me the first letter of the type, and he said L. He died of lung cancer. I asked if it was going to kill someone in the future, and he said yes. I asked for a name, and he spelled out my friend's name. I asked if he was joking, and he said yes. We kept joking around with him, like I asked if he was Satan, and he said yes. I said, are you sure about that, and he said no. I asked if Satan had better things to do, and if he was a busy man, and he said yes. We also got him to spell out gay. When we asked why he watched me, he spelled out why not. He also said he didn't know what the internet or school was. He couldn't give us any actual details of our future and was mostly just messing with us. We asked if he liked us and liked talking to us and he said yes. At some point we asked if Satan created demons and he said yes. We asked him about other demons and he said he didn't like them and didn't talk to them. We asked if he was lonely and it like literally flew across the board. It seemed like a sensitive topic. It also seemed to be predicting questions before we asked. My dad rung the doorbell, so we said bye and my friend had to go. That was the end. We were talking to him for two hours. Was it dumb for us to continue to talk to him even after he admitted he was a demon? Also, the only time I really felt weird was when he spelled out man. Was it even a demon at all? He was actually really chill and was going along with whatever we said, even if he didn't know what it meant. Back in the early 80s, when I was only about 5 years old, my parents were attending a weekend convention in the city of Huntington, West Virginia. Several of our friends and family were doing the same. We were about two hours away from our hometown, so the adults had grabbed some hotel rooms and we split up. The women went shopping while the dads took us kids to see a movie that was showing in town. Fire in the sky, I'll never forget. As we walked down the street, I looked up and saw something big and red floating in the sky. I could see people's arms waving from it. Confused, I asked my dad what it was, and as it turned out, I was seeing a hot air balloon for the first time. I was mesmerized and pondered on how a simple balloon could hold people in the sky when I had tried so hard to fly and my balloons never seemed to get me off the ground, let alone take me there. I noticed the people were so happy and not afraid, considering I had often wondered what I'd do to stop or come back to the ground if I ever succeeded in going up. I thought about that balloon for a very long time, even after we were seated in our seats inside the theater. It's showtime. The movie we were seeing was Fletch, starring Chevy Chase. I was only about five, so I wasn't interested in that movie at all. It didn't take too long for me to start getting angsty and wanting to move. I pulled out every young kid's go-to card when they're not wanting to sit still. I've got to pee. I didn't want to sit there any longer, and I didn't want to ask my dad to take me. 
He was a grumpy man at times who disliked being interrupted. Decisions, decisions. Finally, I whispered over to my older cousin and asked if she would go with me. I told Dad that Dana was going to walk me to the bathroom, and to our surprise, our dad told us to get all of the girls to go since we had been cooped up inside or in a car for such a long trip. So my cousin and I, along with my two female friends, headed out to find the lavatory. We had never been to this place before. It was an enormous place, very old with many doorways, so we stopped to ask some men at the concession stand where the restrooms were. One of them looked at us, pointed to an arched doorway across from him and said, just follow those stairs, they'll lead you right to it. As the four of us shuffled down the winding staircase, we noticed we could hear what sounded very much like a party coming from downstairs. There was music playing and the sound of laughter in the distance that, for some reason, made us slow our pace and start asking questions. One of the older girls dismissed it by saying it might be a scene in the movie coming from above us that sounded like it was coming from below. We tiptoed down the stairs but stopped when we reached the bottom. We found ourselves standing in the middle of a lavish room that looked as if it were plucked right out of an old movie. There was a huge fireplace with a crackling fire inside, a four-post bed with curtains with fancy gowns tossed upon it and a pair of fuzzy slippers next to it in the floor. The music was still playing and the voices still laughing and having a ball, but now I could hear dishes clanking. Whoever they were, they were having a jolly old time. The chatter seemed to be coming from the room around us, but there was no sign of anyone present. Are we in somebody's house? I remember whispering, alarmed we would have been seen and get in trouble. Dana mumbled, I don't know. He said go straight down these steps and well, we did and this is where we are. I was so tiny that it seemed to take me forever to walk across the floor. Our whispers of curiosity echoed off the walls. Straight across the room from the staircase was a door that we assumed housed the toilets. What are we going to do if they catch us? I asked. My older friend shrugged and said, Tell them that we were sent here to pee and ask them where the bathroom is, I guess, and laughed. We found the bathroom. It was equally elaborate, but only one sink and toilet, and on the sink was a hairbrush. Blonde hair twirled around the bristles. We looked at each other, but said nothing. We all were in agreement with how strange this all was. We did our business as quickly as possible, then rushed out of there. As we made our way back across the room, one of us spotted a lit half-cigarette burning inside a pedestal ashtray. Somebody lives here, I said, looking up at Dana for agreement. With that, the four of us ran back up the stairs as fast as we could. Little and fat, I was always the last in line at everything. Back in the house, we hurriedly tucked ourselves back into our seats and didn't as much as look at each other for a very long time. I had forgotten all about the balloon. Now I couldn't get that bed out of my mind or those shoes. Why was a bed in a movie theater? Why clothes? Why was everything so fancy? And where on earth were the people that those voices were coming from? There was only one other door in the room, which was the pee room, so where on earth were they hiding? About thirty minutes later, I felt a nudge from my right. Don, Dana whispered. Bub and Shane just came back from the guys' room. They told me they saw pants and a belt in there, and that they heard a man talking. We exchanged a look of wide eyes. I know I saw those things, and I know that they were physically there, but something was telling me this was different in some way. Did we really see that? I asked. Were they really there? She looked at me bewildered. We all saw them, so yeah. I simply nodded and turned back in my seat. Keep in mind that this was happening to me around the same time my own home was being exercised by every church and person of faith coming and going into my home. I was having a hard time knowing what was normal and real and what was otherworldly and unseen. I'm 11 now. The old house had been destroyed by the boulder and... We were now living in the double-wide trailer. The year is 1989, and my gifted class is attending a production of Babes in Toyland. I have no idea where the show was being held at, but I am not feeling good and not really wanting to go on the trip. My mom insists that I should go. I rarely went on school trips, but she thought since I showed an interest in the arts that I might enjoy it more than I expected. 
I was menstruating and cramping and in quite a crabby mood, but I agreed to go. I remember sitting on the bus, looking out the window, headphones over my ears with New Kids on the Block first album playing in my Walkman cassette player. Despite being in nearly every club and academic challenge team known to my county, I wasn't a very sociable kid. Socially awkward at bus with a sense of humor that could sometimes mask it all. I tried to appear unapproachable but failed. Adrienne, a girl from my class sat next to me. She was pretty and always upbeat and chipper. I liked her but at a time like this, her sweetness could give me a toothache. She chatted away. To make it stop, I remember handing her my Walkman and telling her she could listen for a while. I didn't intend on what being a tie that binds, but apparently that was BFF material and we bonded together from that moment on. I would later be glad for that. As we lined up outside the theater to get our tickets, I looked up at the marquee all outlined with big clear bulbs. I smiled at the old look it had to it. Over the years, I had grown an appreciation of antiques and things that keep their story but age well. The lobby was so packed with kids, all from different schools around the state, so it was hard for me to take in any of what might have been there. Adrienne and I found our gifted teacher and scooted down the row our class had reserved. I picked a seat and sat there, scanning the whole place, watching different kids find their seats, spill their snacks, and all of that. I didn't think much about me watching people until I started feeling watched. I glanced around expecting to see the person whose weighted stare I felt creeping upon me standing nearby. There was no one. I scanned the crowd thinking maybe I would catch them watching from afar as I had been. Nobody near or far seemed to be paying me any mind. The lights were low and it was hard to see but I made eye contact with not a single person. I still felt watched though so I looked up to see if perhaps there were any balconies. There were, and they were beautiful. Finally scrolled like those in an opera house. Just as my eyes settled on the one above me to my far right, I noticed a shadow. I waited for my eyes to adjust, but the shadow never solidified into a person, blocking light. It went from transparent to non-existent in a matter of seconds. I paused for a moment to rationalize, then chose to distract myself from the uneasiness by taking in the rest of the architecture and the magnificently painted walls and ceiling. This place was just beautiful. Before too long, the lights in the house went back and the show started. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, though. As I sat there looking up at the balcony, the curtains and valances that adorned it, listening to the musical voices of the actors coming from the stage, I kind of chuckled at the Phantom of the Opera vibe that being watched in a theater by an unseen man from the shadows had. I laughed, but it wasn't enough to calm my nerves. I pulled the go-to card and told my teacher, I gotta pee. I made my way past her with Adrienne following behind. When we got to the lobby, it was empty save for the concessions workers, and I could actually see the carpeted floor and the gorgeous arched doorways dawn in ornate curtains. It was as beautiful as I had expected. I'm looking for the restroom, where do I find it? I asked, interrupting the worker's personal chat. Through that doorway, he said, pointing with his head to the arch to the right. Just follow the steps and it'll lead you right to it. I nodded and off I went, thinking slowly in my mind, where have I heard that before? There were girls coming up the steps, so I slowed my stride while I thought to allow time and space for them to pass. Follow those stairs... Why do those words seem to have a bad feeling attached to them? My stomach felt queasy and my breath grew quick. I felt as if though I was in trouble but I didn't know why. Adrienne could see that something wasn't right and asked me what was up. I told her I didn't really know, that I just felt ominous, like something was going to happen to me that I wasn't ready for. I explained the panic attack seemed to have something to do with what that guy had said but I understand the connection. Each step I took down those carpeted steps made me weaker and weaker in the knees. The carpet. The red, scrolled carpet that looked so familiar. I wanted to vomit, or faint, or vomit and faint. I didn't know which, so I just slid down the wall and sat right where I was. By this point, I was starting to cry, still not knowing why I was hesitant. I looked up at the walls. 
there were gold scones elegantly placed. I looked at the walls. They were curved to the right just as the stairs were. Suddenly I started having flashes of walking down these winding stairs on the red carpet before. But why? Why was I there? I calmed my breath and closed my eyes as I tried to remember. A couple of girls passing by noticed me on the floor crying and stopped to check on me. Adrienne told them I was fine, to go on, but as they left she asked, Are you okay? I nodded. I had no clue what was going on, but I knew I couldn't sit in the floor forever. I got up and we stared down the stairs one step at a time. I don't know, I told her. I just have the craziest feeling like I've been here before and something bad happened. I don't remember being here, but I don't know, I just don't feel right. I stopped just before turning the full curve of the wall. I can't go down there. Let's go back upstairs. I can't do it. We turned to our seats and tried as we may to watch the show. I love theater and I tried hard to immerse myself in the performance, but I couldn't let go of the uneasy feeling nor the flashbacks. And I still had that strange feeling of being watched when I sat in the house. All of my thoughts must have read on my face because Adrienne leaned in and whispered, What's going on? Why are you afraid? I don't know, I answered, shaking my head. I have no idea. It's almost like I've blocked out whatever scared me. Aid sat quietly for a moment then whispered, Want to go back? It might come to you. I shook my head no, but sat there reflecting on my mother. I thought about how scared she was of what she couldn't see at her old home, how she always felt watched, and how the things she said always proved to be true, even when she nor the rest of us could see them at the time. I thought about how the fear of what she couldn't see had changed her and controlled how she went about her life. I didn't want to be controlled by something that didn't make sense. I needed to see what was wrong. Yeah. I eventually whispered back, let's go. As we shuffled past the other students again, a memory flashed before my eyes, fireplace. I didn't know the meaning of the fireplace, but I was certain in my gut a fireplace was a key element in the sphere. We explained to our teacher that I was sick and needed to go back to the restroom again, and that we may take longer than expected. She nodded in understanding as she could tell that I clearly wasn't well. There was a fireplace. I told her as we entered the lobby for a second time and headed through the arched doorway that presented the staircase. I'll know if it's real or not if we get to the bottom of these stairs and there's a fireplace. With that, I trotted to the bottom and stopped, aid bumping into me. The fireplace. There it was. I said nothing. I was in shock. Just as I remembered seeing it. White, mantle with posts, the mirror. Suddenly everything came back flooding back and I remembered everything, the clothes, the bed, the disembodied voices that surrounded me, the dread of being watched by people I couldn't see. She and I hadn't stood at the base of those stairs but a couple of moments before, beautiful isn't it? A voice came from over our shoulders. We both looked to see a woman standing there with us looking around. We were startled by this simply because she had come from nowhere. She hadn't come down the stairs with us. We would have heard her, saw her with as close as she would have had to have been in order to get there around the same time. She wasn't in the room in front of us when we had entered either. She just simply wasn't there, then simply was. I don't think I can describe in words the elegance this lady carried herself with. She too looked plucked straight out of a Hollywood classic on A&E. She had pale white skin, Blonde hair that probably would have come to her bra strap had she not worn it smooth into those waves and curls you could see on most vintage pinup models. She had sweet blue eyes and wore a very well fitted green dress suit with the long shirt and jacket that tapers at the waist but flares out just below the hips and simple heels. On her left, just over her heart, she wore a golden rose brooch pin. I knew of stranger danger, but I didn't find this lady frightening as she smiled at me. Hi, Don. She grinned down at me. Now that put a lump in my throat that Adrienne didn't notice. Nobody but my family called me by my middle name at this time. 
Most people didn't even know my middle name, and school staff certainly didn't call me by it. If she were here with the school system, she'd have called me by my first name, I thought. She's not... Aid had just started to tell her our excuse for being in the restroom when the lady cut her off. I know, she said. She's scared because of what she saw years ago. Is that right, Don? You remembering when you and the girls were here and how scared you were? That was it. How did she know? Yes, when the girls and I were here years ago, there was everything, everywhere. And how did she know? My eyes grew large, but I simply nodded, speechless and afraid. Why were you so scared? The lady laughed. Because we weren't supposed to be here, I told her. You saw things that didn't make sense, didn't you? Adrienne looked at me, wanting to clarify what this lady was talking about, because I hadn't told her the story. I nodded. You don't know what you were seeing, do you? I shook my head, and she smiled and then continued. When you came here with your family, you saw a motion picture. But during the Great Depression, this was home of vaudeville. This was the first time I had heard of vaudeville, but I nodded to show I was listening. Now, acting back then was actually frowned upon and considered immoral, so a lot of actors and dancers lost their family when they found their talent and calling. There was a soft fondness in her voice, like what was found when one is reminiscing of their own days gone by. Many people came to the theater on a dream with no money. They came to make money. But it was the Great Depression. There was no money. She shrugged with a thoughtful pause. A lot of actors lived down here. This room, the main sleeping quarters, and here, she said wiggling a finger for us to follow her as she crossed the room towards the fireplace, giving the wall a little push. A door that was unnoticeable to us before gave from the wall and opened. I was honestly afraid to follow her inside. What if she locked us in? I didn't know this lady. I poked my head in and looked around. Here is the kitchen, she said, pointing to the left. And sometimes if you had money or family, you could call them. She gestured to what remained of an old telephone booth. It was aged, rusty, and looked to be the playhouse for mice for quite some time. Adrienne was seeing the tour through a totally different set of eyes than I was, of course, but she found it interesting nevertheless. I, however, had more questions than answers creeping in. The last to be buried was an actress before the street was paved over their graves. The bed? I asked where people sleep, she replied in a matter-of-fact tone. The clothes? Their clothes and costumes. The party and the cigarettes? They lived here, she chuckled as if to say I just told you. What she told me explained everything, except I hadn't been there during the Great Depression, and except how she knew who I was and what I had even seen. Was she in the building when I was last there, and if so, how did she recognize me now that I was much older? Was she a... How do you ask someone if they are a ghost, politely? Is there a politically correct term for that? The best thing I could muster was... Did they die here? Yes, plenty did, she confirmed. Pointing to the wall behind the phone booth in front of us, she said, As I said, some of them didn't have families to bury them and... Churches wouldn't always do it because you were seen tainted, not really someone they'd want to have in the church ground, so a few of them were buried back there. The last was an actress. There wasn't a street back there in those days. The city has since paved them over. So her family couldn't come visit her even if they wanted to? Adrienne pointed out. The lady shook her head. That's so sad. I sighed. It is sad, the woman agreed. Do you understand now? It wasn't here, was it? What we saw and heard. It was here, she nodded firmly. Not as you experienced it exactly, but it was most definitely here at one time and you just so happened to experience it. 
Does that make you feel better? To understand what you were seeing when you and Dana were so young, to know they couldn't hurt you. No, lady, I wanted to say. You just called my cousin by name and nobody here even knows her. You can't know that. How did you know the person with me then was Dana? And you just informed me that I had crashed the Great Gatsby of all ghost parties. I'm more frightened now than I was at six. I didn't say that, though. I merely nodded with a sigh. I was ready just to be back upstairs in my seat watching the Frankie and Annette wannabes like the rest of my class. I said nothing and looked silently about the room with the fireplace, taking it all in. Adrienne drew closer to me and asked, Do you feel better? Are you okay now? I nodded then thought of something I wanted to ask the lady. I couldn't. She was gone. She remains a mystery. Adrienne and I both froze, looking at each other. I poked my head back into the room hidden by the secret door, but she wasn't inside. Aid looked inside the room with all the toilets. She wasn't there either. The two of us were standing at the base of the stairs, and she certainly didn't come past us. Needless to say, we sprinted faster than we had the first time. When we got back to our seats, neither of us could wrap our heads around what had just happened. How'd she do that? Adrienne asked. She just popped up and just disappeared. How'd she do that? I shook my head in silence. Do you think she was a ghost? I don't know. I didn't know what to think. She was one of them, wasn't she? That's how she knew everything. She was in that room with you guys when it happened, and that's how she knew. She had to. Why didn't you just tell me the story? I didn't remember it. I snapped. Was this what my mom had been experiencing all those times with Ronald? Did he appear that vividly to her and make so much sense? What was happening to me? Would I be okay when I got home? Should I even tell my mom about this or would it scare her? There was too much to this for me to wrap my head around. I told Adrienne not to talk to me about it and to never bring it up. It's 2019 now and all of those years she only mentioned it twice. When last asked about it, she told me she couldn't remember. In about 1995, when we were teenagers, I decided to tell Dana about my encounter with that lady. I got as far as, Do you remember when we saw that stuff in that bathroom that time? And she shut me down, telling me yes, but she didn't want to talk about it. I tried to explain that I had more to add to it, but she didn't want to hear it. From my 20s on, since the internet became available and information a lot easier to come by, I have researched my tail off, digging through the history of the old theater. I have watched documentaries. I have read old newspaper articles. Every single thing that the lady told me was true. Many people had died in that theater, not just performers. Two electricians had met their demise while working on wiring. A maintenance man met his death in the projection room, and the man my cousin heard in the downstairs bathroom very easily could have been the spirit of the homeless man who had taken up shelter there and froze to death. Shadow people had been reported in the balcony, just as I had seen that day. The ladies' powder room on the mezzanine is said to be inhabited by a beautiful lady in fancy red clothing, much like my bathroom beauty, but it seems nobody has ever seen the lovely lady in green down below. There have been numerous reports of people hearing a lady in the downstairs woman's bathroom and experiencing the same poltergeist activity my quartet did as a child, but no visions. I keep searching and searching for a story where someone says they have actually seen her or spoken with her. To this date, it seems Adrienne and I are the only people who have a face to put with the action. Why materialize for me and nobody else? I don't know. Who is the ghost lady thought to be? Is she an actress? Perhaps the one she singled out in her story? Is she the same lady seen upstairs in red doing costume changes on the other side? Did she work for the company in some other area, such as finance or tickets? Who is this lady? Nobody seems to know. I've not come across her face in any paintings or newspaper clippings in all my years searching. 
I will probably never stop looking for her face, her story. This happened while in high school over 15 years ago. 14 to 15 year old male at the time. I have only had one experience like this and believe it was random. I grew up in an older two story modest home with my mom in a small town in mid Missouri. My bedroom was upstairs and rectangular in shape. It was long, spanning most of the length of the house. On one end was a window facing the street and on the other end was the bedroom door. My bed was near the window side of the room. That particular evening I was up late watching some random shows in my room. I remember feeling uneasy. Something didn't feel right but I couldn't pinpoint what. It had been an uneventful day. Eventually I got bored with the TV, crawled into bed and somehow fell asleep. Instantly I awoke and shot straight up in bed. A crippling sense of dread consumed me. I was terrified and couldn't explain why, and what really worried me was feeling that way in my own room, a familiar place where I had always felt very safe. Not that night. I felt like I wasn't alone. I must have been sitting upright for 15 to 20 seconds before swinging my legs over toward the right side of the bed. I purposely kept my eyes low on my legs and the floor. Then, after several long seconds which felt like an eternity, I slowly glance upward toward the other end of the long room. It was mostly dark except for a small amount of light from the dim street lamp outside that penetrated the closed blinds behind me. This light provided just enough illumination to barely make out the layout of the room. In front of me, halfway between my bed and the door, stood a dark, featureless, human-like shape silhouette. When my eyes glimpsed it, I felt petrified and my first thought was to curl up fetus style underneath the blankets and hope that whatever it was would go away. That is paralyzing fear. I quickly rationalized that hiding under the blankets wouldn't get me away from this presence. I needed to get out of the room and directly through it was the only way. I mustered up whatever courage I had, shakily stood up on both feet and bolted toward the door to escape. While passing through it, I felt the coldest sensation shoot throughout my entire body. Every hair stood straight up, which made me speed up even faster. I got to the door, swung it open, and flew down the stairs. I stayed down there for some time while trying to process what had just happened. I then went to the living room where our family dog, Trixie, a Rottweiler pit bull mix, was sleeping in the kennel. I got her out, leashed her, and cautiously walked to the base of the stairs that led up to my room. I don't recall her acting weird or noticing anything, but I still felt something was up there, so we slept on the living room couch the rest of the night. That's my only possible paranormal experience. I didn't feel physically threatened by it, like my life was in danger, but definitely got the feeling that I was unwanted. As if I had trespassed onto someone else's property and needed to get out now. A couple of things, my dog slept in my room often at night but for whatever reason she was in the kennel that evening. I often wondered if she would have alerted me if she had been in the room. Also when I initially woke, it felt like only minutes had passed since going to bed but I had actually been asleep for 2-3 to three hours. The home is located at 702 North Clark in Mexico, Missouri. Google map it if you want is the home with the grey roof and very light green almost white colored siding, has cement stairs along the right side. The house used to have a large tree in the front yard that made it look a little creepy at night. The window to my old room is the upper left one. The other upstairs windows are part of another bedroom. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merchandise on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.